Well, good evening, everyone. Is that too loud? Okay. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I want to first of all thank our sponsors who made tonight possible. That's Fran and Neil Kritz in memory of Neil's father, Cantor Carl Kritz, Judy and David Marwick, Debbie and Max Rudman. We appreciate your support. The leader of tonight's cheer on the David Ori, Psalm 27, is Ms. Sharon Freundel, whom many of you probably know. Uh, but let me tell you a little about her that you may not know. Sharon has degrees in both nursing and Jewish education. She has been both a speaker and educator in day schools and adult education settings throughout the Washington area for 30 years. She was the department chair for Tanakh and Torah Shabal Peh at the Melvin J. Berman Hebrew Academy, then went on to become director of Hebrew and Judaic Studies, as well as of Jewish life at the Milton Gottesman Jewish Day School of the nation's capital. Today, she is managing director of the Jewish Education Innovation Challenge, a new national organization whose mission it is to improve education in Jewish day schools throughout the country. I have known Sharon for 30 years and have always enjoyed her programs. I asked her to help us expand tonight's annual priestly host year, and she offered to lead uh, on this topic, which I really appreciate very much. After her share, you're welcome to enjoy refreshments. I'll bring more food out. We'll be on the table back there in the back of the room. And around 11.45, we'll start our communal kumsits, uh, led by Rabbi Ozzie Burnham and Marty Jacobs and Moshe Fisher, accompanied by Hirsch Kamaro and Yehoshua Scheininger. Uh, interspersed with words of wisdom from Rabbi Rosenbaum to help us get in the Slichos Ready frame of mind. I thank all of tonight's participants for making this possible, and all of you for coming, especially in the bad weather. Thank you, and now I'll share and find out. Yushu uh, Harav, thank you to, to Stuart for offering me this platform. And as uh, Debbie first pointed out, aside from the hour due to the weather, we really get schar alicha for, uh, for coming here for the speech and for slicha. There's been a, a debate on the Jewish education listservs for a while about how to learn Torah. Should we be learning Pshat? Should we, we be learning Midrash? Should we do uh, Mefarshim? And the truth is, we can get something different out of all of those different aspects when we learn Torah. So we're going to take uh, Tehillim Perich of Zion, chapter 27, and we're sort of going to unwrap it, looking at it through various different aspects this evening. I'm really glad we're doing this because Ladavid Hashem Ori, as we know, is at the end of Tefillah, by which time, you know, Shabbos morning, Kiddush is downstairs waiting, everybody can't wait for announcements to come, right? So we usually race through it and we don't take a minute to say, what is it that we're saying and why is it here between Rosh Chodesh uh, Elul and uh, Hoshana Rabbah? And hopefully we'll answer some of those questions today and get a little inspiration. So the first thing I want to do is ask for a volunteer just to read the English so we can remind ourselves what this is about. It's on page two of the handout, and this is a translation that I did myself. Um, those of you who know me well know that a frequent trope that I repeat is that it is impossible to learn Tanakh in any language but Hebrew. Because when you translate, by definition, you put your interpretation on it. But just for convenience sake, we're going to start with the English, and then we're going to go back and look at the Hebrew in depth, exploring some of the nuances of the language that David HaMelech used when he wrote uh, Perich of Zion. Is anybody awake enough to read the English? Blaine? Hashem is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Hashem is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers came upon me to eat at my flesh, even my adversaries and my foes, they stumbled and fled. Though a host should encamp, should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise up against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I have asked of Hashem that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of Hashem all the days of my life, to behold the graciousness of Hashem and to visit early in Hashem's temple. For he conceals me in his sukkah, in the, evil of, in the day of evil. He hides me in, 
in the cover of, cover of his tent. Upon a rock he lifts me up. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. And I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices and trumpet sound. I will sing and I will sing the praises to Hashem. Hear Hashem when I call upon my voice and he, and be gracious to me and answer me. In, in your behalf of my heart has said, seek my face. Your face, Jerusalem, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not put your servant away in, in anger. You have been my help. Do not cast me off. Neither forsake me, O God of my salvation, nor my father and mother have forsaken me, and Hashem will take me up. Teach me your way, Hashem, and lead me on an even path. Because of them that lie in wait for me, do not deliver me over to the evil of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen up against me, and such as breath, and such as breathe out violence. If I had not believed to look upon the goodness of Hashem in the land of the living, wait in hope for Hashem, be strong, and let your heart take courage, and wait in hope for Hashem. Even if we stop right here, this is tremendously inspiring Kapit Luk Tehillim. And hopefully we can build on that. The first thing we're going to do is look at the Midrash Tehillim that appears right under the English translation. Because if you see the way I named it, it's Psalm 27 in the High Holidays, Tehillim Chazayin V'yamim Noraim. Why do we read this around Yamim Noraim? There are a number of answers. But one of my favorites, and you'll see in a minute why it's one of my favorites, comes from the Midrash Tehillim. So let's take a look at that and see why we read it. Historically, it started out by being read only on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And then over the centuries, it was actually expanded out into the beginning of Elul and through uh, Hashanah Rabbah, which is essentially the last day of Sukkot. But it is primarily for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Rabban and Pitre, Krabah Rosh Hashanah uvi Yom Kippurim. So the rabbis say that we read it on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippurim, Uri Rosh Hashanah, God is my light, specifically for Rosh Hashanah, Shahu Yom Adin, it's the day of judgment. This is a quote from another capital of Tehillim. And uh, you should bring out the, like, um, the light of your righteousness and your judgment like the afternoon. Vishi, my salvation, Yom Kippurim, that refers to Yom Kippurim. That God should save us by forgiving us for all of our sins. When those who want to do evil rise up against me. These are the leaders of the nations of the world. To eat my flesh. They come as the prosecuting agents against us before Hashem on the Day of Judgment. Tsarai v'yayvayli, my enemies and my adversaries, at motzei hasatan b'gematria shin samachei k'minyan yimot hashanah chaser chad. You will find that the word hasatan in gematria equals 364. So let's figure it out because a lot of these gematria, they did approximate uh, uh, arithmetic. Uh, hey is five, right? Sin is 300, tet is nine, nun is 50. Indeed, this is 365 minus one. Kol yemot ha yesh Israel. Every single day of the year, the Satan can prosecute us in front of God. Chutz mi Yom HaKippurim. Except for Yom HaKippurim. The Satan has no control, no power over us on that day. Amar that should say HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, Eim God said to them, you have no permission to touch them today. Afal but 
In any case, go and see what they're making themselves busy with. Kevan shahola echumotze otam, kulam bata'anit u betfila u levushim begadim levanim, umu utafim kemalachai hasharet. So the Satan goes around and he sees all of us fasting, immersed in tefillah, wearing white clothes, wrapped like the ministering angels. Yad chozer babusha chlima. Comes back really embarrassed and disappointed. He wanted to find something wrong and he couldn't on Yom Kippurim. Amar leya Kadosh Baruch Hu. God says to him, so, what did you find when you went out among my children? He says, they're just like the ministering angels. There's nothing I can do against them. So God reprimands and he makes them suffer. And he tells us, I have forgiven you. Mikan ve'elech omrim Yisrael im tachane alai machane umot ha'olam lo ira libi. From that point on, B'nai Yisrael says, if they make an encampment against me, those nations of the world, my heart will not be afraid. Ve'im takum alai mulchama b'zot ha'bitni botech. And if they raise war against me, in this will I be certain. What is the zot? Zot. I will be certain in the Torah, which is called Zot. Vizot ha Torah. And that's why, on Yom Kippurim, the Satan has no power over us. And then the Midrash goes on to talk about the Sukkot, Ki Yitz Benemi Besukkah. That's not totally Shayach to what we're doing today. I must tell you, I love this Midrash. But I especially love it because whoever wrote the Midrash, 365 minus one fit, but those are not the days of the Jewish year, right? That's the solar year. The Jewish year is 352, 353, 354, but it works. So the Satan has no control over us on, on Yom Kippurim. I want to go on to read um, a couple of excerpts from Machzor Masorah Taraf. This is the uh, commentary of Rav Soloveitchik uh, on the Machzor for the Yamim Noraim. The Rav, if any of you uh, ever had the privilege of studying with Rav Soloveitchik or have read any of his works, looks at everything as a dialectic, as you can see it this way, you can see it that way, and never the twain shall meet. It's funny because people used to say, Rav Soloveitchik was about thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, but if you read his works carefully, the synthesis never happens. The Rav lived with a dialectic between, you know, Adam Aleph and Adam Bet, and Perak Aleph and Perak Bet of Sefer Breshit. Here too, we see this dialectic that he reads in Perak of Zion of Tehillim. Um, does anyone want to read the English? There are two levels of divine punishment. Thank you. There are two <coughs> levels of divine punishment, divine justice, and I can't do the Hebrew, sorry. That's all right. Concealment of God's countenance. The former involves punishment commensurate with one's sins. The latter, on the other hand, is a temporary suspension of God's <coughs> actual surveillance. He turns his back, so to speak, on the world's events and leaves matters to chance. Concealment of God's countenance is a result of Israel's waywardness and may be regarded as the ultimate punishment. A child can bear a father's reprimand or punishment, but to be totally ignored by one's own parent is a frightening experience. Concealment of God's countenance is not a rejection of the original act of creation, as this would destroy the world. Instead, it is the undoing of certain restraints and controls while God still remains the sustainer of creation. Through tshuva, the Torah assures us 
God's close surveillance can be restored. All right, so let's stop there for a minute. Each of us has a personal relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu and a national relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Right? There's the very famous Teretz, why is uh, everything written in Ravim in plural? Uh, right? Bilshon Hara. It is me who spoke the Lashon Hara. Why am I saying our Chet? On one hand, I am being mitvada, I'm, I'm confessing my own Chet. That's my personal relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And I confess and I attempt to do tshuva, not because I'm afraid of punishment, and not because I'm afraid of Hashem, because I know I have damaged my relationship on a one-to-one -one basis with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has, take care, has taken care of me, and in, re in, in return, he asks us to keep the mitzvot. When I violate a mitzvah, I'm distancing myself. I'm destroying that personal relationship. At the same time, I am one small part of the national relationship that we all have with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. The deen is my personal deen. Whatever judgment the Kaddish Baruch Hu decides for me for the coming year, that's for me. But the Hester Panim is my national relationship. And whatever part I have to continuing that Hester Panim, that concealment of God's face from all of us, I need to be aware of that also. And that's part of tshuva. And as we get into the text of uh, Parat of Psalm 27, we will see that dialectic of the individual and the national relationship with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. The Rav then goes on to describe, in a very rough way, one of the most arcane, difficult to understand psukim, which is Pasuk Yod. Ki aviv imi azavuni v'ashem yasveni. For my mother and father, my father and mother, have abandoned me, and God will gather me in. Everyone knows that this is not historically true. David HaMelech's parents never abandoned him. So what is this about? Why is David HaMelech invoking the idea that he's been abandoned? Does somebody want to continue with the next paragraph? Beginning, though my father and mother have forsaken me? Though my father and mother have forsaken me, Hashem will gather me. Before my operation, when my family said goodbye to me, I understood the above words of the psalmist. Did ever a parent abandon his child? Of course not. Yet in certain situations, one is cut off even from his parents or his beloved wife and children. Suddenly one realizes that there is no help which his loved ones are able to extend to I stand before God, no one else is beside me. A lonely being meeting the lonely, loneliest being in utter seclusion is traumatic but also a great experience. These two experiences, that of non-being and that of loneliness, must not be forgotten. This is also quintessential Rav Soloveitchik, if anyone has ever learned the lonely man of faith. Rav Soloveitchik talks about this concept of existential loneliness. So let's see how we can explain this. Have you ever been to a, a movie and you feel like it's life-changing, and you walk out with the person that you were there with, and you went, wow, that was amazing. And the person goes, yeah, it was OK. <laughs> what do you mean it was just OK? It was, it was a movie. It was fine. That's existential loneliness. Every one of us has gone through in life some time period where we feel there is not a single person on earth who can understand what I have just gone through, who have, can understand what have I, I've experienced, who can understand truly who I am. Rav Soloveitchik's ultimate solution to existential loneliness is a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Turn to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Yes, the person next to you may not understand, a Kodesh Baruch Hu understands. 
That's the concept of kiyovivi inyaz of univashem yasveini. It's not that literally parents have left us, but even our parents, those whose DNA we carry, there are times when they can't understand us, when they can't help us, and then how much more so do we turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, who will always understand the experience, who will always have the capability of helping us. That's one of the other points of this process of tshuva. We need to maintain this relationship so that Hashem can continue le'asfeini, right, to, to gather me in. So having said that, let's go back to the text. Um, you know, Rashi is famous on the first page. We're going to look at the Hebrew. Rashi is famous for frequently saying, Ein ha-mikra yotzei midei pshuto umashma uto. The text, you can do whatever you want with the text in terms of, well, you can't do whatever you want, but there are always layers of perush and medrash and yet we always go back to the text because you cannot take the text out of its original meaning and what the author intended. So in Kamisha Chum Torah, it's author with a capital A. In Tehillim, it's author, David HaMelech, and the ten uh, composers who, who wrote Tehillim with him. But this is clearly by David because that is the first word. So we're going to go through this, and I'm going to show you some of the poetry, the beautiful, absolutely amazing poetry in this. You know, David HaMelech's son, Shlomo HaMelech, says, En kol chadash tachadash There's nothing new under the sun. People think that meter in poetry, interpretation of poetry, that's all a really modern thing. Nonsense. It was way back here when David HaMelech was writing his incredible poetry in Sefer Tehillim. He has a play on words even in the first pasuk, because technically, even as you see as I wrote it, Le David, David wrote this, Hashem Orivi Shi, Hashem is my light and my salvation, but you can also read it, Le David Hashem. Hashem is for David. This is not uncommon where one word goes to the clause before and the clause after. Ibn Ezra often points this out. One of the, the examples is Shir Shalyom for Friday, the Friday psalm. Um, Hashem malach geut, lavesh, lavesh, Hashem oz hitazar. There are too many verbs in there. And Ibn Ezra says, Lavesh Hashem Oz Hitazar, the Lavesh and the Oz are both modifying this, this uh, object of Hashem in, in the Pasuk. So you can both interpret it, Le David Hashem, Hashem is for David, and Le David, David wrote this, Hashem Arivishi, Hashem is my light and my salvation. Now, interpreting in interpreting Tehillim, there are different ways of lining up the words. There is straight poetry and there is chiastic poetry. Straight poetry is when the word usages are completely parallel in a pasuk. So if it's verb, noun, verb, noun, that's straight poetry. If it flips around to verb, noun, noun, verb, the, the Mechaber is trying to tell us that there is some change taking place. And we can see this in this parak of Tehillim. Uh, Hashem Orivishi, Hashem is my light and my salvation. Mimi ira, from whom I, shall I be afraid? Hashem Ma'oz Chayai, Hashem is the strength of my life. Mimi Evchad. From whom shall I fear? These are two parallel uh, clauses in the Pasuk. David is repeating it because this is what he means. I don't have to be afraid of anyone because Hashem is with me. Right? We say this at the end of Shul every Shabbos. Hashem li lo ira. God is with me. 
Who should I be afraid of? Now, let's take a look at the next pasuk. Bikrov alai mereim, when those who want to do evil against me come near to me, le'echol et bisari, to eat my flesh, tsarai v'yohevai li, um, my adversaries and my enemies, hema kashlu v'nafalu. They stumbled and fell. Why would they stumble? If a Kaddish Baruch Hu is protecting David HaMelech, and David is lauding Hashem, isn't it more scary when they stumble? Why didn't David just say, Heman HaFalu? They fell. There's a reason for this, because think about when someone is coming towards you. If they stumble, do they stumble forward or do they stumble back? They stumble forward. And what David is expressing here is, they're coming against me, they stumble. I think now they're gonna get me because now they've been accelerating towards me as they fall, and yet Hashem protects me. They didn't stumble into me, they stumbled and they fell. This is even more of a Shabbat for a Kaddish Baruch Hu than if they just stumbled and fell because then, okay, God has protected me. But there's that iota of doubt as they're stumbling towards him. And that questioning, that vacillation back and forth of David being concerned that a Kaddish Baruch Hu is going to be with him, we're going to see that throughout this parak of Tehillim. And to me, that's one of the reasons that we read it. Because don't we all go through that? Yes, intellectually, we know a Kaddish Baruch Hu is going to be with us. But what if? What if something happens? What if I, I have been um, acted in such a way this year? Maybe a Kaddish Baruch Hu won't be with me this year? If we don't have that iota of doubt, of concern in our minds, how do we do a proper tshuva? You have to have that doubt in order to grow. And that's what we're going to see throughout this capital of Tehillim, throughout this chapter of Tehillim. In Tachana Alai Machane, if they camp an encampment against me, lo yirali be, my heart will not be afraid. If they raise a war against me, in this I am going to be assured. And as we saw in Midrash Tehillim, one of the explanations of Bzot Ani Boteach is the Torah. Now, there are other explanations in another, um, uh, in another section of Midrash Tehillim, but we know it's got to be some word that's in a keva because it's bezot anibotech, right? Not bazet. It's not referring to a kodesh It's Torah, which is a female word. It's emunah, which is a female word. It's zuchut avot. But there is something that is keeping David solid. Now, mimi ira, from whom I, will I be afraid? Lo ira libi, my heart will not be afraid. He is taking it down from the totality of him to his heart. And interestingly enough, there are a lot of mefarshim who believe that the, who interpret the heart as being the center of intellect, not the center of emotion, the way we do now. My intellect will not be afraid because Intellectually, I know a Kashwar who is with me, even if emotionally I'm somewhat concerned about it. One thing I am going to request from Hashem, that is the one and only thing I'm going to seek. Shifti Bevet Hashem Kolime Chayai, that I live in the house of Hashem all the days of my life. Lachzot Benoam Hashem to uh, see the, the, the uh, pleasantness of Hashem, Levaker Behechalo. Now, I translated Levaker as to visit early in his temple. 
Luvaker is one of those words that defines translation. Because Luvaker as in Bikur Cholim means to visit, but it also means to examine. And Boker means the morning. There is this nuance here that I want to be in the Heichal. I want to be in the palace early and often. That's the one thing I want. Now, you can see David's emotional confusion because he's very clear that there's only one thing he wants. And then you go down to Pasuk Zion, and there's more than one thing he wants. Shema Hashem B'Koli, Shema Hashem Koli, listen to my voice. Al taster panecha mimeni, don't hide your face from me. Al tapi afavdecha, don't be angry at me. Al tichemi, don't abandon me. Al tazveni, don't leave me. Horeni Hashem darkecha, teach me your ways. Necheni birach mishar, lead me in a straight path. Al tichemi benefesh sarai, don't hand me over to my enemies. I don't know about your math, but in my math, that's more than one request. So there are a number of ways we can look at this. We can say it's really only one request, because if he's in the Heichal, all of this will emanate from his being in the Heichal, and that's perfectly legitimate. You can also see it as someone who is so desperate, they're saying, Hashem, I only want one thing from you. I need this, I need this, I need this. And again, isn't that what we do to Hashem? Hashem, one thing. Oh, but my children need something, and my friends need something, and Eretz Yisrael needs something. And the Kodesh Baruch Hu will respond even when we say to him, one thing, just one thing will you give me. Now, there is going to be a sea change in Pasuk He, in verse 5, which is the next verse. Ki yitzbineni besuko biyom ra'ah, he will hide me away in his sukkah in the day of evil. Yastireni b'seter ahalo, he will hide me in the hiddenness of his tent. B'tsuri romameni, on a rock he will raise me. That's the chiastic poetry. If it was straight poetry, it should say, Yastireni b'seter ahalo, yoromameni b'tsur. Because that would mean it's exactly the same thing. What the Vita Melech is saying here is there is a fundamental difference between HaKadosh Baruch Hu protecting me by hiding me away or placing me on a rock. Hiding me is a defensive posture. Placing me on a rock puts me in the offensive position, right? The military strategists will tell you keep the high ground because if you have the high ground and you're looking down from there, you're going to be able to vanquish your enemies. So a Kaddish Baruch Hu has now gone from a defensive posture to helping the Bid HaMelech be in an offensive po uh, posture. And now look what happens because he's on the Tzor. Ve'ata, and only now, Yarum Roshi, I can lift my head all I vice vibotai on my enemies around me. I couldn't even lift my head before. I was so busy trying to protect myself, but now I can stop. And now that I'm stopping, what can I do? I can bring Karbanot in his tents. Now I can catch my breath. Now I can actually talk to a Kaddish Baruch Hu and say, thank you, a Kaddish Baruch Hu. I couldn't do that when I was running for my enemies. I couldn't do that when they were stumbling towards me because I was too worried about protecting myself. Ah, but now, now I'm certain. Now, Ashira Ba'azamra. So now he can say, this is what I need. I need Hashem to listen to my voice uh, so that I, my voice that's calling so that he will be gracious to me and answer me. It's interesting, I was doing research to find out where the phrase Shema Koleinu, as in the Amidah, came from. And according to Otsar HaTfilo, it's from this Pasuk here. So instead of Shema Hashem Koli, the Amidah, we put everything in Rabim, in the plural. 
So it's Shema Koleinu instead of Shema Koli, but it harkens back to this. So as we say Shema Koleinu, we can think back on where does this Shema Hashem Koli come from? It's from taking a moment to say, I'm safe enough. Hashem, please hear my voice or hear our voices. Um, and now he's ruminating. Hashem, don't leave me. Don't abandon me. Don't be angry at me. You almost get the impression that the more he thinks, the more he says, wait a minute. The only reason I can stand here is because HaKadosh Baruch Hu has supported me. But what happens if HaKadosh Baruch Hu abandons me, like my father and my mother abandoned me? The worst, according to the poem, has happened to me already. The unthinkable has happened. So if the unthinkable has happened, that Aviva imi has a vuni, that my parents have abandoned me, what happens if HaKadosh Baruch Hu abandons me? I'm not going to be able to survive. That's the doubt that I'm talking about. That emotional doubt that says, do we deserve this? Do we deserve Hashem listening to our voices? And we need to always confront that doubt so that we can do a proper tshuva. We then get down to Pasuk Yud Gimel. Lulei ha'amanti lirot betuf Hashem be'eretz chayim. Um, if I had not believed to look upon the goodness of Hashem in the land of the living, and in the English I put an ellipsis there. It's not a complete pasuk. It's a clause. He never finishes the pasuk. Why doesn't he finish the pasuk? We'll see what Midrash Tehillim says about that in a couple minutes. But it's it's a way we ruminate, right? When we're thinking deeply, we often don't complete our own thoughts. What happens if let's not complete the thought? And maybe too intimidating to complete the thought. And then he finishes, he comes to the conclusion, even with all his doubts, Kaveh El Hashem, Chazak Becha, El Hashem. Now I translated it as wait in hope for Hashem. Tikva is hope, right? Ha tikva, the hope. But tikva is not only hope. It is waiting in hope for something specific. That's that's the, the nuance that you miss if you're just if you're just translating it as a hope. I'm waiting for Hashem, but I'm waiting perfectly in in hopeful certainty. And that will make me strong and courageous, and then I can continue to hope in Hashem. So what we see in this progression is David running from his enemies, then stumbling, Hashem protecting him in a defensive way, and then finally, when David has the upper hand, he's like, Hashem, now I can stop and talk to you. But what happens if you leave me? I'm not going to be able to exist. And then after this rumination, he's like, it's going to be okay. Hashem will be with me. It's a story here that, that David is telling. And the, the Tanakh, the Nakh, tells us the history of David's life. If you know the history of David's life, this reflects reality. He was running from uh, Shaul. He was running from Avshalom. He had to go uh, down to the, the Plishtim and hide there. I mean, this, this was a turbulent life he had. He was constantly fighting enemies. If not from without, then certainly his demons from within, because this war is both a war from the outside and a war from the inside. <clears throat> So let's finish up <clears throat> by looking at the Midrash Tehillim, Chav Zion Zion, which is on page, I didn't put page numbers on here. I'll get to put page numbers on. Uh, three. It's, uh, it's right before Machzor Masora Tarav. Lulei Ha'amanti. 
Now that you've flipped to page three, I'm going to ask you just to flip for a second to page one. Take a look at Pasuk Yud Gimel, at the first word, Lule. This is a, I, I copied this from Tehillim. Notice the dots on Lule? They don't belong there. I mean, they do belong there. You must have them written in your Sefer Tehillim for your Sefer Tehillim to be kasher, but it's like, what are all these dots doing there? So Midrash Tehillim actually addresses what the dots are doing there, and it reflects what we said from the analysis of the poetic nature of this capital. Lulei he'amanti lirot betuf Hashem. Would that I would believe that I would see the good of Hashem. Tami mashmei to Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yossi taught, Loma nikura lulei. Why do there have to be dots in the in the tehillim on Lule? Amar David lefnei Hakadosh Baruch Hu. David said to God, "Ribona Shalom, Master of the Universe, Yodea ani sh'atida ta l'shalem schar tov l'tzadikim la'atid lavo." I know that in the future you are going to be giving reward to all of the righteous. Aval eni yodea imani beinehem in love, but I don't know if I'm among that group of tzadikim or not. The lule, the would it be, is dotted because of David's doubt. Now let's take a step back. If David HaMelech, the king of Israel, the one who is the ancestor of the Mashiach, who will one day save us, is not sure if he will get the schar that the tzaddikim get, how much more so should we be saying, are we among the tzaddikim in love or not? So let's skip the middle because we already alluded to this. And if you go up four lines before uh, the end of this source, where last three words it says, Kaveh El Hashem, the Midrash asks why these words are repeated again, right? The last Pasuk is Kaveh El Hashem, Chazak V'Yamitz Libech, El Kaveh El Hashem. Why are they repeated? Amar Rabchia Ba'aba. Im nitpalalta v'chazarta v'nitpalalta. If you pray and you go back and you pray again, ostensibly the same words, tehei mevusar shenishma tefilatecha. Then God is going to hear your tefilot. V'hu atid la'asot bakashatecha. And God will fulfill your request. Matam, how do we know? Kaveil Hashem chazak v'yamitz libecha v'kaveil Hashem. Hope in Hashem, your heart will be strong and courageous, hope in Hashem. Go back and daven again. And indeed, as we go into Slichot tonight, isn't that what we're going to do? Think about the structure of Slichot. We say a piyut, then we start Kel Melach, Yoshev Al Kisei Rachamim, and then we go into the Yud Gimel Mido, right? And we do that whole thing. And then we go into another piyut, and then we come back and we daven exactly the same thing. Kel melach Yoshev al kisei rachamim yud gimel mido, and then we say a piyut, and then what do we do? We come back and say the same thing. There is something about this rhythm of falling tonight figuratively on our faces in front of Kadosh Baruch Hu and saying over and over and over again, Hashem, Hashem, kel rachum v'chanam. Once is not enough. We need, like David at the end of this capital, to have the certainty that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will continue to be on our sides. Personally, nationally, will send us a Yeshua, personally and nationally, and that's one of the reasons that slichot is set up the way it is because of the end of this capital, Kaveil Hashem, Chazak V'yameitz Libecha, V'Kaveil Hashem. And my wish is for all of us this year, just as the Midrash says, 
Hashem will listen to our prayers and Hashem will fulfill our requests for health, for happiness, for fulfillment, and for peace for us and for all of the Jews around the world. Thank you. Like so many other things, there's a machloket as to what Eretz Chaim is. There is a reason that we call cemeteries Beit Chaim, because eternal life is ba'olam haba and not ba'olam hazet. This life is very ephemeral. But Chaim, eternal life, that's olam haba. It's not just that we don't know what we're talking about when we go to a cemetery and say we're going to the Beit Chaim, right? Yeah, right? Thanks. Thanks. Um, two quick questions. One is, does 365 also refer to the number of positive mitzvahs? Uh, 248 and 365, yeah, but not in this particular midrash. In this midrash, it's very clearly the days of the secular year. Mm -hmm. and yet, I thought that this uh, Tehillim referred to the battle against the evil inclination. That's why I said external enemies and internal enemies. David is speaking about both of them at the same time. Only when we have confronted our internal enemies can we stop and say, Ashira Zamra Lashem, right? So you're right. It's absolutely both external and internal because this is, this is Tehillim. This is not history, right? Tehillim isn't a history book. Tehillim is a book of poetry in praise to Hashem in pain. You know, it was interesting, when Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated, the, there were most of the young Chiloni Jews, the secular Jews in Israel, had no idea how to respond. And there's a story that someone gave them a Sefer Tihilim, and they said, you have an emotion, it's in here. Just flip through it, and you'll find whatever emotion you need to express, why should we make up our own words? David HaMelech, Keli Keli, Loma Azavtani, in Perat Chafbet. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? Desperation is in there. Love is in there. Appreciation is in there. It's all in there. And because it's written Baruch HaKodesh, David said it better than any of the rest of us could ever say it. Well, thank you. We will be coming after volunteers.